And I'm hoping we're live. Yes, there's a little green button next to live. So uh, I'll, I'll trust what it says. Thank you so much for joining our session today. We'll be talking about uh, millennials and the Generation Z. Uh, millennials are technically Generation Y, but no one bothers using it because it came after Generation X, which is my generation, and I guess the generation perhaps the uh, some of our speakers here today. I will be introducing them uh, a, a little bit later on because they'll be having uh, five minutes each to have uh, their own uh, opinions expressed without uh, many interruptions, and then we get into more of a discussion mode. Now, uh, I don't want to take too much time because I know that we had uh, already a slight delay in terms of uh, the overall uh, day. I would like, however, to start with a little bit of a primer of what a generation actually means, because we talk a lot about it, but we don't really understand, uh, most of us, I guess, if you're a political scientist, you understand it extremely well, we probably have a, even a PhD in it. But um, the concept of a generation uh, started in the, the late 19th century. The first one uh, was from 1883 until uh, you got to uh, 1900s, and this is called the lost generation because so many people who were born uh, in those years, especially men, were, uh, died in the First World War, meaning that we started having uh, a very large imbalance in terms of uh, the number of people that each generation will have. And the same thing repeats it um, because you had the greatest generation fighting Second World War, and then all of a sudden you end up in a situation where uh, the baby boomers that came from 1946 until the mid 1960s, they were much, much larger than the previous generation. I mean, we're talking 60% more people were born and they're living longer than in a previous generation. And what happens then is that generations tend to skip, right? You expect the generation to be how long a person lives until the point in which on average they start having children. It isn't. It is actually a very flexible concept. So uh, eventually it's stabilized into around 15 years. That's been the case for the last uh, three, four generations. And you end up having this kind of context where um, baby boomers, because there are so many, they had lots of millennials, right? Millennials today are half of the working population of the whole planet. This is not something that is just a US statistic. It's across the board. And um, my generation, Generation X from the mid 60s until 1980 was much smaller because it suffered the same implications, meaning that a generation Z are proportionately smaller. And we have to also mention Generation Alpha. Not many people talk about that, which is from around five years ago. They're the ones that are coming, and they're the ones who are going to be suffering lots of the consequences of the fiscal stimuli around the world for the pandemic and um, you no know, climate change. We, we have to you know, keep a, a, a thought for them, maybe a thought and a prayer. But let's focus on millennials and um, Generation Z. So I'd like to pass uh, the torch now to our first speaker. Uh, I, I do have a little bit of a cheat uh, uh, sheet here. Um, he is uh, Jakob Larsen, a future thinker and advisor of Global Ottomaning. I don't know if my pronunciation was about right there. So Jakob is a future thinker and advisor at the think tank Global Challenges. The mission is to create platforms and cross collaborations between different industries spanning across civil society, corporates, politics, NGOs, and academia. Jacob also has years of experience from um, Teach for All, Rotary, and Global Shapers, the World Economic Forum, um, no, 20 to 30 year old forum, uh, where he is heavily involved on in both local and international levels. So he has a PhD, a postgraduate from Dublin City University with a master's in strategic management. Jacob, thank you so much for joining us today. You're basically representing the Western perspective on the millennials and generations edge. No, please take the floor. Thank you so much, and good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, everyone. And I hope you're all well in these uh, unusual times, we can say. And uh, I would like to start off by actually mentioning the crisis itself and what that can bring us now in, in terms of this situation where we have the millennials and the generation said who would uh, then compromise the two thirds of the workforce in the future. I think uh, crises are interesting in the sense that they can bring unity, collaboration, and partnerships along with it. Because we often find that the organizations in our different settings, they will work for the, uh, the best outreach. They will have their own market 
and they will have their own field and their own talent that they want to work with. And now in times like these, I would say that we start seeing more changes. We are adapting and then we're starting more collaboration. I think that's one of the things that are very interesting in these uh, scenarios, especially when we're looking into the future and how we then can impact the future of the workforce. I would like to mention just uh, an example from uh, the country that I represent, uh, where we have a young entrepreneurship uh, forum and program. Uh, annually, they take in 30,000 people, uh, and uh, that's a huge collaboration, uh, which is between the government, public companies, private companies, corporates, and also senior entrepreneurs themselves. So all this is a safe place, a platform where young individuals have the chance to build and create their own things, their own companies. They do their own financial reportings. They practice public speaking and pitches as well. And of course, they do this in a safe and fun environment where they work together with others. And I think that's just one example on how we can uh, can say build the bridges between organizations, but also to the younger gener generations. And of course, that's just within entrepreneurship. And I, I just like to throw out there, imagine if we had this within multiple sectors, uh, areas where we normally wouldn't go. It could be arts, for example. Uh, imagine if we had the governments and uh, the companies as well working alongside in doing this. Of course, there are great examples out there. I'm certain about that, but doing so even more. Now we're talking about the mass scale here of uh, young individuals coming in to the market. And also in terms of leadership, um, I've read multiple articles uh, from uh, INSEAD, Harvard, and along the other great institutions. And what I see between the lines is that we're talking about a lot about value-based leadership. And I have a favorite myself, uh, Simon Sinek, who talks about start with why. And for those who have seen the new Netflix, Netflix series, The Playbook, Gilles Ellis said, stay hard and true to yourself. And I think that's also highly interesting now for companies, organizations. Now we're, uh, it's a little bit shaky uh, with the COVID situation and where there's going to be challenges with the new groups of the workforces as well. I sometimes say that we should invite people to the room, but we should also dance with them. And that's, for me, like a metaphor that when we're going into projects, for example, make sure that all the people are invited. Make sure that they are part of the decision-making, that they can be peer-to-peer -peer with their senior colleagues so we all can work elaborately and have it as a learning process. And I think that's going to be a key factor in our leadership when we're in integrating these young generations. Because they say that they want to be part of things. They want to feel that they are valuable and that they are represented. And this, that could be also a whole topic in itself, all the diversity uh, perspectives that are related to that. But I find it's very interesting that they want to feel included and that they want to feel empowered. And times can be challenging for young individuals as well, new into... Uh, into their careers. And then, of course, it's really important that we, as those who are more senior, that we can help them, empower them, carry them through the tougher times as well, being the mentors, although it might be the case that they have to change project, they might have to change companies. But that's also one thing that, for, for example, the INSEAD showcased that this is something that could be one of the greatest challenges now as well, to empower them through the changes that they're going through. And uh, I've also seen that uh, in a research where they have scanned and discussed with the generation said in the Scandinavian countries, less than 50% would be interested in becoming leaders of tomorrow. And if that, comp in that comparison to countries like India and Malaysia, where it's up to 77 and above, I think that's highly interesting. And what they've said is that it could be too stressful and challenging with work-life balance. So there will challenge us as well. How do we work with that? How do we ensure that people get even more inspired in the work, that they want to achieve greater things and really be the leaders of tomorrow as well? How do we ensure that they see the beauty of being a leader and not just 
the stressful aspects and uh, things such uh, challenging work-life balances. So I would say empathy, compassion, and also uh, a great termination from the whole workforce itself uh, would be great. And that we have this work based on collaboration, unity, and that we actually take on this challenge and be up for adapting and take on the changes that it could include. Uh, so I will leave you with that. And those are my initial thoughts. Thank you. All right. So uh, thank you so much uh, for that, Jacob. Um, and now I would like to call uh, on stage, so to say, uh, Amandeep. So I'll do a quick intro. Amandeep uh, Mida is the founder of Nerd9 Denmark. So you fully assume your nerdiness. You know, I, that, uh, I, I deeply respect that. Uh, I, I'm still a, a, you know, a hidden nerd uh, somewhere. I need to dig it out whenever it's required. So in um, your intro will be, Amandeep is a technology professional with extreme interest in people and culture and has lived in so you have been around. Uh, he was actually CTO of the first Danish fintech incubated at Techstars in New York, and otherwise is a mentor and uh, coach for foreign professionals in Denmark, where he also found this community called uh, Nerd9. Uh, he regularly hosts events to discuss debate technology and social causes to drive fluid policy making with consensus building. Thank you so much for joining us, Amandeep. So the floor is yours. Thanks, Marcelo. Uh, thanks, everyone, and uh, uh, thanks uh, for this opportunity. Um, as uh, <clears throat> we already kind of started discussing around uh, uh, millennials, uh, I think uh, I I would kind of uh, put it in some uh, concrete points, uh, as you might have seen me hearing before. So, uh, first of all, like uh, what I see, um, having lived uh, uh, different uh, places, uh, different countries and cultures, and working with uh, technology teams, nerds, uh, mostly millennials, mostly millennials. Yes, um, the primary thing which I kind of uh, kind of differentiate here is like the millennial mindset that we are talking about. Which mindset we are uh, we are dealing with? So me, this is a set of people. This is a set of demography. If you if you say that, like the life is built on kind of a choice, uh, then that's an important difference. That compulsion is not like the conditions that you expect. Um, that also means that they they are not that uh, grateful, <laughs> uh, but considering the other options available uh, to them. Um, and, and I think um, the point came already from Jacob that, uh, especially in Scandinavia, 50% uh, do not want to take a leadership position, like do not oh, aspire that. Uh, that. That speaks something. Um, uh, okay, let's not rush to the conclusions. Let's kind of a, a, a run through a little more of a structure here. Um, so it, it's, it's pretty common that like, uh, okay, I have studied law and uh, then I was interested in programming. And um, after working with a law firm, I want to switch over to programming career altogether. Uh, can we make that smooth or uh, can, can there be like a less cost of switching? I leave that an open question. We can have come back probably again. And uh, then is, uh, especially in a COVID situation and what, what all uh, the pandemic has led us into. Um, uh, workforce is remote already. Uh, so how could you track such workforce? How could you track? Mm -hmm. um, not in terms of micromanaging, but uh, what, what I suggest is like tracking wor workforce on certain values. Uh, when you start working with them. And one of the point which uh, while being in Denmark, I, I kind of raise and uh, uh, make some noise about is like ending the free internships. I think I will run a <laughs> live poll as well on that. Um, free internships, uh, according to me, they, they prevent the entire career conversation. Uh, because if interns are seen as a free labor pool, which is a very predominant thing in Scandinavia. Uh, you do not have that skill conversation and uh, career conversations happening at all. So given the mindset and given this uh, kind of a circumstance uh, of societal setup plus pandemic, uh, so you can assume what kind of a mindset uh, we are uh, playing around with. 
Jacob already pointed on some <clears throat> some frameworks on uh, driving um, um, collaborations. Um, again, depending on cultures, the culture where you come from, because we are dealing with diverse workforce. So there could be like coaches, uh, like Tesla, for example, uh, provides a coach to every new joinee. Um, and uh, otherwise, the collaborative projects, like um, in, in my uh, prime, prime employer, what we do is uh, we have uh, hackathons, yes, upon the new, new graduates joining. And then every six months, they have to kind of still work with the same set of people, same team they joined with and kind of uh, present an improvisation and they're given hourly credits for that. Um, what about the employers uh, kind of uh, trying to listen to their employees? Is it like coaching, a skill development conversation, engagement? Um, in my opinion, uh, over there is uh, while dealing with the nerd nine, the, the community and the people who attend and uh, talk is, uh, is, is, is better to kind of like set a career platform for all multiple skills within the organization and uh, you are free to choose and sign up and based on your interest like you don't belong to a department but you are you are okay to move with and uh, during the pandemic uh, we have seen that a lot of uh, people who stick with their jobs they have kind of diversified their skills they have kind of find their new passion they have found their new passions and um, somebody to totally from uh, back end development programming switching to business intelligence uh, like why because the person got time this time to prepare for those skills or the, the new field open up for themselves just a, just a small example um, <clears throat> um big red button uh, yeah that that's another uh, kind of a conversation like um, when you should call it quit or when should kind of when when you quit or when when you quit is uh, spe specifically conversation when you need a either a coach at a workplace or you need a, a kind of a support structure that what tells you maybe this is a job maybe this is an assignment which was promised to you but it is actually not what what should be my criteria to call it quit for example like if i'm seven months into a job and i'm suddenly want to change and my my uh, my organization tells me uh, that um, uh, no, uh, before one year you cannot do that, and now you completed one year, and you come to the point that you have two options. Which option I should take? Who should be providing that conversation? The organization itself, external coach, internal coach, and and trust me, we are we dealing with a generation which whose life is built on choice. Uh, <clears throat> um, the conversations around uh, the the whether to join startup whether to join a large or a goldilocks scenario of um, a, a, a in a workplace which is uh, large enough but works like a startup uh, i believe it is 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 again uh, through kind of a, a company should provide the framework it could be coaching it it could be more collaborative projects uh, where you kind of figure out like what is best for you um, so leaving leaving my kind of a uh, the end note over here is like uh, we are dealing with the uh, we're dealing with people's uh, free will free choice and uh, giving them uh, economic freedom and that is the true empowerment for uh, for them to uh, figure out what they want to do across this the new new opportunities which came out in this pandemic as well that that's all for me yeah thanks that's great. Uh, thank you so much, Mandeep. And um, you're, uh, busy, uh, you're giving us a perspective that's not only from Denmark, what you're doing at the moment, but also the countries where you lived before. And uh, a multicultural perspective of coming from India and being in a very different environment. Um, our next speaker uh, also has a lot of experience, uh, especially in Asia, with more than 30 countries. Um, active in terms of the business that has developed. So it's uh, Vijay Esvaran. I hope that I pronounce it correctly, uh, Vijay. Uh, he's a prominent Malaysian entrepreneur, speaker, philanthropist, and author, uh, founder and executive chairman of the QY Group of Companies, a multinational conglomerate with interests in direct selling, retail, financial services, real estate, hospitality, and education. 
Uh, QI Group is headquartered in Hong Kong, Kuala Lumpur, with operations in more than 30 countries. And uh, Mr. Vijay is very passionate about developing the next generation leadership. So I think that we could really benefit from his experience in terms of how the current uh, leaders of the world can support the uh, future generations, millennials and uh, Generation Z more specifically, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, fostering their creativity and giving them a, a new horizons to explore. So Vijay, no, please take the floor. You're most welcome. Well, <clears throat> let me uh, begin by saying what Jakob did very aptly. Good morning, afternoon, and evening to all, uh, depending on the you know, zones that you're in. Uh, in a sense, I think, uh, first of all, we need to begin to uh, look at the fact that everything is in flux. So the rules that we basically grew up with, the rules that we lived in until uh, COVID, uh, pre-COVID and all of that uh, is up in the air. So basically the cards are being reshuffled everywhere. My viewpoint would come in from a slightly different angle because I'm uh, also an employer. And from the uh, company viewpoint, uh, we are employers, as uh, Marcelo has pointed out, in 30 odd countries. Uh, we are e-commerce based, so we also have to deal with a very active customer uh, database. We have a, 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 somewhat in 2015, we crossed over the 10 million barrier uh, or network across the world. Uh, we have conventions where the customers come uh, and the customer and, and staff um, uh, divisions in terms of um, Age groups is very interesting because they are now pretty much the same. Uh, Gen Z as well as um, uh, millennials are accounting for roughly about 70% of staff. Uh, so we're something like 1,500 people scattered in 30 countries. And then again, you have the same mix of 70% uh, being millennials and Gen Z among the customer database. So for us now, both the Gen Zs and the Millennials have become critically important uh, in many ways. Understanding them, working with them, and dealing uh, and communicating with them has become a more fundamental uh, part of the exercise and strategy of marketing and everything else that we do online. But the pandemic is a, a critical composition of what uh, has led to all this. Uh, and very clearly, uh, we are seeing what has happened because you have the Gen Zs dealing with everything from school closures and shifts in routine to the millennials who are uh, structurally having to deal with a world that is in a way, uh, you know, broken up because the world that they thought they were being prepared for while they were all the way through education. You see, the, the millennials basically went to educational systems, particularly in Asia, I think it's pretty much the same in, in Europe and, and North America and elsewhere. Uh, we have an education system that is primarily designed in the early part of, uh, you know, the 19th and 20th century. And this is staffed by people, academics, teachers, lecturers, and, and the like, who have been structured again for the 20th century. And trying to prepare them for jobs in the 21st century. So that's a total disconnect. So the education system, in a sense, has failed them. It is not providing them uh, the venue for which they can actually prepare themselves uh, for the workplace. So this has resulted in the fact that we now need to basically think how we can attract these people, hold these people, and actually work with the, both the Gen Zs and millennial, millennials moving ahead. This has resulted in us coming up with different ways to support our current leadership and to inspire them. And this begins with dialogue. Uh, for us, it's interesting because the dialogue has opened up a lot of different thinking. Our mainstream thinking had to be restructured. When we sit and talk to the millennials, their expectations are very different. There's also a cultural difference. I mean, Jakob talked about the fact that, um, you know, more than half of the uh, youth in, in Scandinavia are not very much interested in leadership, whereas in places like India and Malaysia, the figure is much higher, 70%, I believe he said. Uh, and I, and I uh, totally agree with that. But having said that, a lot of that has to do with a cultural difference as well. 
you know, uh, this work-life division, uh, in a sense, which is so critically important to Western cultures, is a little bit different in Asia. In Asia, as Amandeep will probably recall, I don't know when he last left the Indian subcontinent, but uh, work is survival. You know, it's a lot more about, you know, being able to survive, being able to uh, support the family, deal with certain uh, responsibilities and duties that are, you know, beyond the need of a, a, a division between, you know, uh, recreation and vocation. So uh, this is where uh, the difference perhaps is becoming a little bit more uh, visible within the statistics. See, for the, um, if there's also a division because to talk in a pan-Asian uh, context means we're talking of various cultures. This is by far the biggest continent. So to speak about it, you know, in a sense of an Asian culture per se would be uh, technically wrong because there is no such thing. So if one were to go to the Far East, you know, uh, and here I'm talking about uh, Northeast Asia, which is Japan, Korea, Taiwan, China, and the like, their uh, approach to work is uh, incredible, I would say. It's very different from the uh, rest of the planet. I have worked in various places and in various continents, actually. But their work culture in Japan, Korea, uh, Taiwan, and so on is um, in, a, in a fashion uh, to, to try to uh, symbolize this. Uh, you know, in Sweden, I'm sure they say good morning when they cross each other in the, on their way to work. And, and boy, do we have to go to work again kind of thing. But, you know, in Korea, for instance, when they greet each other, they say, you know, work hard. You know, the uh, common phrase is fighting, go in fighting. And that is an, an attitude towards work because work for them is not really different from their so-called, you know, recreation uh, rest and so on and so forth. They actually embrace the work culture. Hence, uh, the stress comes from a totally different position. Am I doing well at work as opposed to am I getting time off at, you know, to be able to go to the beach? So basically, uh, the differences in the culture also are reflected in uh, places like Malaysia and Southeast Asia and India. In India, uh, predominantly, I, I think Amandeep might have an opinion on this as well. You know, uh, it's a, there is uh, many different classes to look at. And to each class, there's a different mentality. So you see, you cannot basically put a label and say this is the Indian response because, again, there's no such thing. But what is happening is that the millennials have brought together the world in a fashion that has never happened before. The millennials, be they from the African continent or from Central Asia or from India or, for that matter, the Far East and so on, in a way, speak a language that's very much more similar. They, the thing that they want to see happen is very interesting. They want sustainability. They want a better, you know, uh, a life health-wise. They are very clear on the point that the previous generations have screwed up and screwed up in a big fashion. So there's no real respect, so to speak, for uh, their predecessors and, and they feel the world is being handed to them in a basket that is a total chaotic mess. And you cannot blame them, blame them for that, you know, in a sense. But what is very interesting is that they do believe that their generation is more creative. They do believe that, you know, and they, they have uh, uh, an affability to digital technology that none of us did. You know, they were faster to react to iPads, tablets, and so on than any of our generations or before us. Hence, they are at home in the digital technology. They also know how to turn that to their advantage. You know, using things like, for us, actually, Facebook is cutting edge technology. At least it was at the time that, you know, I joined the workforce. But today it's outdated and it's actually considered to be almost near the call. So in a sense, you know, they have a whole bunch of stuff out there leading from TikTok, which incidentally, despite all of its challenges, is proving to be one of the most creative fields out there. Snapchat and things of this nature, which they turn into digital savviness. They actually make it uh, using an entrepreneurial spirit that is amazing. They make it into a different field of play and they have enriched us in terms of business. 
Uh, and our business, which initially took a little bit of a dive at the beginning of the COVID era, started to pick up again, primarily because of this factor, because of both the fact that 70% of our staff and workforce belong to the millennial Gen Z group, and likewise for the customer database. They were talking the same language. They reacted better. They recovered better. They adapted adjusted and accommodated to the new norm, so to speak. Now, whether or not, you know, things will ever go back to the pre-COVID era, one thing's for sure, many things are going to remain and they're going to remain the same moving ahead. So the thing that I think we need to do is to encourage and provide ways for the Gen Zs and millennials to actually express themselves and to be able to be able to choreograph and obtain certain experiences out of them in order to start working to make sure. Mentoring them is a critical, critical point. And I agree with that with both uh, Amandeep and, uh, and Jakob. In a sense, for us, the mentoring starts with cross-generation mentoring because here we have a lot of people, baby boomers and Gen X like us and so on, who are caring so much in terms of life experience and this life experience is a critical component which the millennials perhaps need to complete their equation so to speak this uh amandeep's um, position on them not being very uh, grateful is uh, something i have to agree with i don't think it's so much about being grateful although i do agree with amandeep that that is the expression that is felt out there it's more about them not being able to attach a value they are not able to attach a value to what they are receiving. Hence, uh, the point of gratitude or ingratitude doesn't arise. They just don't see a value in it. Hence, the value, their value systems are somewhat askew. And the mentoring is very critical for that aspect because it allows that uh, crossover of cultures. You see, in Asia, many of our cultures have survived through oral traditions. Hence, our uh, passing on from generation to generation doesn't happen through schools or universities, academics, or any kind of scriptural knowledge or any kind of written form of, uh, you know, uh, generational input. It is always oral. And these oral traditions are very critical. And that's what we need to now evolve and develop in the workplace. The oral traditions, which I look at in terms of the cross-generation mentoring, is what you know carries on and carries forward and mm -hmm. i think that you know uh, if one, one is looking to the far off future which is in essence what we're talking about today it begins with the fact that we need to be able to build a bridge between the so-called past even though the follies have led to where we are today and to the millennial gen z generation working together and that would be the basis upon which uh, any kind of progress moving forward would entail, in my opinion. So back to you, Marcelo. Well, thank you so much, Vijay. And I, I have a few comments, but uh, I'll keep them short. The first Please. one is that, indeed, you cannot compare uh, Asians uh, and put them on the same basket. It's the same as in my family on my mom's side is from the Amazon. It's basically saying, yeah, Native Americans. You know, that includes... Uh, Alaska, Patagonia, and uh, Arizona in between. So they all have very different characteristics. And the one comment I'll make in terms of Sweden versus South Korea, the last time Sweden went to war was probably against Napoleon in any significant scale. Uh, and uh, South Korea, they have a very imminent threat just next door. And that really makes a big difference because you realize the value of life, the value of freedom, the value of happiness. And in Sweden, they have it easy, good for them. Uh, I, I do hope that they remind themselves that uh, this was hard fought uh, many centuries ago. And uh, in the rest of the world, I think there is a little bit more gratitude than you'd have in the more kind of uh, established societies where life is perhaps a little bit easier than it should be. Um, I, I will try to uh, get Kevin Lee, who's our next speaker, uh, to to join us. Uh, we are doing that in a slightly different way. I'm giving him the microphone because of some technical issues. So I'm hoping that Kevin will be joining us now. Kevin, please say hi. Yes, there you are. Uh, welcome. Uh, and I hope things are going well in Toronto. I'll do a, a very quick introduction and then you, you can have uh, your slot. 
So Kevin is the uh, COO of uh, China Youthology and um, is also the managing partner there and uh, a leading China futurist and consumer-centric innovation expert. He's an executive consultant for marketing, innovation, and purpose-driven brands with companies like Nike, Apple, P&G, BMW, L'Oreal, Danone, and Intel, etc. And uh, he's a frequent speaker, uh, most notably at the uh, Microsoft CEO Summit and uh, Can Lions International Festival. I guess it was virtual this year. Uh, and much more. He's uh, equally a goalkeeper in association with the Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Foundation. We had a, a great conversation about uh, Western and Eastern perspectives uh, on, when we were talking about the preparation for this call. Thank you so much for joining us, Kevin. The floor is yours. Well, thank you, and uh, I hope you guys can hear me, and I apologize for the technical difficulties on my side. Uh, but yeah, hello from Toronto. It is about 4.50 in the morning for me, so very late night, but happy to join you guys on this uh, very important discussion. Uh, I, I, and, uh, but I'm representing, of course, uh, China and uh, Asia, uh, and that's where I've been uh, working and building my career for the last 15, 20 years. Uh, and of course, my time has been spent understanding the next generation, observing them, and working with them and bringing youth-driven change to the world, specifically to the corporate world as well, and to the marketplace. So it's uh, it's great to hear your thoughts. and. You know, I, I want to start off by first responding to some of the questions, uh, some of the statements that have been made, uh, you know, previously around how maybe this next generation is not really interested in taking on leadership. And, uh, you know, for, for me, that the response there is to ask the question, well, wh what word did we use when we asked them the question about leadership? Uh, you know, because, of course, in a young person's mind, if you're asking them about leadership, they're like, I don't want to take over. <clears throat> I don't want to take over some large arcane organization, you know, that's probably not the thing that I think about for leadership. But the amazing thing is that young people are extremely creative and they're ambitious, you know, and, uh, you know, for them, they don't ask the question, do I want leadership? They ask the question, uh, I want to do something. And if it just so happens that a lot of people follow me in doing it, then that's great. But nobody in this generation is going out there saying, I just want to grab leadership. It's more of, I want to make a difference. I want to do something in this world. And whether or not leadership comes as a byproduct of that is something that they will find themselves in. And we're seeing that, of course, with a whole new generation of leaders stepping up, none of them wanting to be leaders, but them just wanting to make change. You know, and I definitely see that, you know, whether we're in uh, COVID or, you know, pre or post, definitely in China, even pre-COVID, you, you just saw young people are completely ambitious and, uh, and creative. I mean, uh, the reality is that in China and in Asia, Nobody is waiting for the classroom to come back. Nobody is waiting for people to come back to the office. Everyone is extremely busy doing what they want to do. I mean, in, in China, uh, you know, we see all the young people as live streamers today. All of them opening up their, their own e-commerce shops. All of them, you know, working hard at esports. All of them, you know, on Minecraft. They are entrepreneurs by talent, by nature. They don't have to think about, they don't have to be trained as entrepreneurs. They are creative and they're always doing something, pursuing, not just for fun, but they're pursuing with expectation that it will build. And so, you know, that's the, the young person that we're finding in Asia, an extremely ambitious and creative uh, person who's hungry to do something. Uh, it doesn't have to be big picture, but they're trying to find opportunities to create a mark in the world or at least create a way for themselves. But that's where some of the key uh, issues are for us today. That's where some of the key challenges are. I think, especially for Asia and for China, uh, uh, I think one of the key issues that we have to deal with is that we need to change the narrative of, of what success looks like. You know, today it's just about you got to go to the Ivy League. You know, uh, the government just talks about you have to pass the test and get the high marks. But we all know today, especially all of us in this room, that the path to success is so diverse and it has to be celebrated and it has to be supported. There has to be a lot more narrative to say, hey, we are going to support diverse uh, experiences that will get you to uh, different areas. I mean, I'm encouraged by, you know, when Google and Facebook, they talk about how their hiring practices don't really look at your degree, but really look at your diverse experiences. But the question is, do more people talk about that? Do more companies talk about that? And does the state talk about that? But that's the reality, because if the young person in their society, in their family, does not get uh, people saying, hey, your diverse experiences will be recognized and will be of value, it creates in them deep tension and they question whether or not they can try. And so the first thing that has to be broken is the mindset and the heart set that helps them think and to know, 
if I pursue different ways, it will amount to something. And we as a society have to change that narrative. So that's the first thing that, that we definitely have to see. I say the second thing, especially for China and Asia, for this creative and ambitious generation, what is the key thing lacking for them is creating equal access to materials and resources. Now, materials and resources don't just mean money, right? It doesn't mean school books. What I really mean here is are things like open data, right? I, I mean things like open challenges, right? When you look at what the Obama uh, administration did in opening the government data, you know, when, when people can do that and allow people to use that data to do different things, to, that, that's real resources. That's real things that people can use to create and you can actually produce something that will offer something. When, when you know, uh, all those billion dollar prizes on space um, invite people from different uh, backgrounds to think about how do I launch a satellite into space? That's an open challenge that more people can take part of. If young people have more of these resources and more of these challenges, this will be the platform for them to really think creatively. And again, that has to be collaborated with the, their school systems, with their education systems, and with the industry as well. Well, it can't just be something on the side, but it has to be something where the education institutions and the, and the industry recognize that if I pursue these different accelerators, incubators, you know, open challenges, these are something, these are things that actually have a job at the end of it, or these are some things that have accolades and recognition at the end of it. These are things that they do. You know, taking a page from where we are in China, we have grown out of the success of special economic zones. I, I would propose that we have to have something more like special education zones where it's much deeper collaboration between industry and education in opening things up. At Chinese Ethology, we do a lot in, to, in terms of helping companies to become platforms for young people, where they open up their products, their services, their R&D, so that young people can use them as free uh, resources to create something new. And the companies that are able to do that, to open themselves up, uh, you know, it's not to train them as mentors, to train them into good little employees, but it's to open up the entire company as a platform so that uh, young people can actually build something new. And the companies that know how to do that are the ones that are innovating further. They're the ones that are innovating faster. And so uh, that's what we do at Youthology to help them out. You know, I think the final thing that I want to mention here is around, of course, mentorship, which is a topic that has become a theme uh, from many of the, of, of the speakers before. And, and I would agree that mentorship is really important. In China, people are, are hungry for mentorship. But I would also say that the mentorship that is needed, um, you know, while, uh, while Cross-generational is nice, and nobody will say no to that kind of mentorship. The one that's truly needed for, uh, for the Chinese young person is the peer mentorship, and the, the, the peer that is maybe only five years ahead of them. You know, because the reality is that in China, their world has changed so quickly that the previous generation, their experiences are almost obsolete. The last generation didn't have social media, they didn't have AI, they didn't have big data, but this generation does. And so they need somebody that's just five, you know, maybe just 10 years ahead of them that has some experience in the world that they live in to help them work through what are the interesting options and the new creative ways that I can network the opportunities around me. And so that's definitely something that we don't have in China. You know, we don't have, young people cannot find access to, to mentors. They can't find people that are close to them, uh, you know, to, that are like-minded or like-hearted. But that's definitely the opportunity that we want to see. So anyways, those are a few things that I want to uh, throw out today, uh, some of the interesting opportunities and, uh, and challenges that we have coming from Asia. All right. Um, can you guys hear me? Because I'm having some uh, issues uh, with videos appearing. You good? Yeah. So let me try to put the video on again. Um, the, the screens kind of keep on vanishing. So um, uh, as you might have noticed, we went uh, through a journey around half of the world. Right? We started with Sweden, and then popped by Denmark via India. We arrived in Malaysia. We uh, visited 30 countries in Asia through Vijay's experience uh, over so many years uh, of success. And uh, then we popped by China uh, with you no know, kind of a a little bit of a virtual presence from Toronto. Now we're going back to Europe via Russia and the Netherlands with uh, Alexander Stamos, who is the president of the Circle of Sustainable Europe in Belgium. And um, he uh, is uh, a Generation Y slash Millennials, Generation Y being the other name for um, Millennials. Uh, his shape uh, used strategic reorientation and developed new business opportunities combined with current and future environmental projects with a top-down and bottom-up approach towards sustainability. 
Uh, furthermore, he's an accredited lobbyist. I have no idea how you become a lobbyist. I guess it must be a very interesting process. You, you must lobby to become a lobbyist, right? Um, in the European Parliament and a young expert at the World Economic Forum. So, uh, Well, uh, thank you, Marcelo, if I may, may start. Uh, and thank you for this chance. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm now uh, at uh, back at home because uh, thanks to COVID-19, everything is need to be really uh, outside and informal because if you want to do something in Brussels, do it by a restaurant, not at the parliament. Um, at the current moment, I see so much of possibilities, but in the same time, also a lot of struggling. The biggest uh, three points that I still uh, see as a uh, message for uh, the youth and also to tell others is that we have our problem, but in the same time, we also want to make action and impact in the same time. So what I see in the youth in the current moment, what I didn't have because I had an older structure because of more culture, is there is too much of responsibility in the same time. So it's really important that uh, if you start uh, with something, you already uh, need to have already so much points, not only for yourself, for your agenda, for responsibility, internet making it big. So indeed, what already uh, were told about what kind of possibilities there are, we need some assistance with it. And uh, how to start it? Well, simply starting with little steps thinking about the possibilities around you, not going uh, straight away international because you get simply uh, too much of information. Um, so uh, start with a little initiative project and uh, try to develop it to convince the municipality or the province or the governmental part to give you some uh, advice even feedback is already welcome, not straight away that they give you money or advice straight away only as feedback. With this feedback, you can learn so much because if you try to connect or, um, connect with the people and ask them for the feedback, they sometimes like you more than if you uh, ask them for money or ask them for, an, uh, for a right answer. So um, that is uh, for the topic of uh, just a moment from uh, the situation of the problem. In the same time, uh, I have experienced a lot of gaps. You maybe also experience a lot of uh, misunderstanding. People speak about things, but you, they cannot find it in the policy. They cannot find it on the Internet. They cannot. So it's, it's a little bit how you can uh, acknowledge yourself with the right information and uh, I tried it by stepping out of my own comfort zone, so starting not only uh, looking at things that I uh, uh, learned at school or heard by my family or by organization, no matter at all. I, start, I started with uh, speaking with other coaches, other countries, and asking what kind of uh, things they are doing in other ways. So by this acknowledge, uh, acknowledgeable topic, I started to understand that our world is bigger <laughs> and more difficult than I ever know before. Um, so uh, instead of uh, having the responsibility by doing yourself, it's really good to advise the young people to do never it alone. Also for other, because if you look at organizations, if you look at two entrepreneurs, if they apply for European projects, they've always partners, they've always some stakeholders who give giving feedback. So if you want to make success, try try to make uh, a nice team around you, not just friends that make enjoyable uh, steps and, and a, a good, funny information part, but people who are making you stronger by finding skills that you still haven't developed so they can help you with it. And at the same time, you can help them. So it will be uh, in the same time from both directions, a big boomer. And I uh, already uh, uh, spoke with uh, uh, some youth that are trying that and they're making indeed really big steps because one is only focused on writing, one is on the, in, on the internet. So if they're doing what they seriously go can do really well and also have the people around them that always uh, can be as a backup, they have more convinced in the current future than at the moment because 
if you uh, if uh, if if I look at my own uh, situation, sometimes even now they're asking me uh, what kind of education I did, what kind of uh, people I know. So always I need to prove something to make a further step. And if you have something really nice with the group, you always have some uh, preparation for it, and you also know how to engage with people. So. Uh, Beside of that, uh, try uh, as much as possible uh, connect and call with people that you really like, uh, like uh, 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 writers, uh, journalists. Uh, do not only look at social media. Try to find the people who is the writer or the person who has developed the knowledge or uh, developed the information that you're reading. If you speak with this pe kind of people, you get sometimes even more information or earlier information than that you can uh, uh, read or can find. Um, uh, even so, uh, beside of the bubble, we, uh, uh, there's also a problem with respect and trust. If you look at some kind of uh, cooperation or network, they always uh, beside, uh, look at you like a person. So uh, it's really important to uh, focus on your personality, focus on how much you trust yourself, because it, you, you can say that you trust other, but first try to uh, look at yourself, what you can, what you should do, or where you need help, and be also always uh, concrete and fair at the beginning. So the people that you want to work with have no surprises. And in the same time, try to have a good communication uh, always, no matter at all. If you have something happening, communicate it well, because maybe you have the problem, but your other partner or colleague can help you with it. So do not wait till the end, because this is still happening and it's uh, understandable that sometimes it is but if you try to communicate uh, as much as possible you get uh, even more uh, communication in uh, rolling uh, down the hill um, about the topic action it's really uh, good to also acknowledge what kind of activities, what kind of sessions they are, because you see so much happening, even in COVID-19, so much of digital events, you cannot uh, already uh, find out uh, what you want to select. So it's really important to first look what kind of interests you have, uh, which kind of people you uh, really uh, like to join, uh, make further steps with the interest and not uh, going in, uh, each week uh, each week to the same group because, because we have so much communities where people are sitting in the same community for four or for eight years and uh, and do not connect with all other communities so try also make the step by uh, by some topics that you not understand or your community not understand or not agree, try to acknowledge it further than it's uh, in in the situation uh, uh, um, uh, from uh, that point. Um, uh, in the same, uh, I have I'm happy and uh, that I've the uh, guts that when I started with uh, social engagement with networking eight years ago, that I've developed seven years ago initiative to connect youth and elderly together. And when I see how much of knowledge and a uh, big uh, impact it can develop in which kind of direction, if it is space or artificial intelligence or sustainability of entrepreneurship, if you find the people who are really inter interested in it and you, you organize or find some nice events that they can connect for sharing the knowledge young person with the student points or uh, extra grades for futuristic uh, jobs and uh, the people in pension or in a nice function that they do something for the future. It's a really nice step. And I did it for seven years. I had experienced that I re was really amazed how much uh, there, is, there is possible, not only in my own country, but in others, uh, other places. And I also can say it fair, thanks to that I'm multicultural, I did uh, more of success and knowledge uh, in international way than in my ho ho uh, own home uh, country. So it's a little bit uh, experience that you make, uh, you need to make to, uh, to develop. Um, and also uh, try to uh, 
go uh, not only at activities, but, but check all the projects that are available, ju uh, just like Horizon, Horizon 2020 platform of U uh, European Union. They have, you can find so much of projects that are already accepted with the people, with kind of information. And if you want to be involved, they are open to answer your questions. So instead of thinking about, I will do it because uh, it's the chance to make the change, it's really important to look what kind of current projects they are and they can add you in and make the project stronger. So um, uh, Marcelo already said about uh, how, uh, how I uh, became a lobbyist uh, this year. Well, uh, it get, I, I got luck since uh, several years. I know a lot of lobbyists from the age of 30, 40, 50 years. That, so they already developed in, in around 10 or 20 years. And they told me that they surely want to help with my ideas because I already shared a lot. So it's uh, sometimes uh, the people know me because I already spoke with a lot of people, but uh, they uh, they uh, wanted to help me because they saw some things that they forgot to do to do by themselves because they develop their own mission vision get a job get a uh, get a uh, get a house get a family so it's uh, all, uh, all each person has also their own life and it's indeed uh, understandable that not uh, each person can do everything for others so i'm really uh, also happy that uh, that i got the chance got the knowledge and got the accreditation at the parliament in march and uh, by this point i'm trying in the future also helping students and master stu master uh, uh, young professionals to uh, learn them how to lobby how to get accreditation and make further steps because you see so much of act act uh, action and uh, uh, marching outside but if you look at lobbyists lobbying places i do not see very much young people so these are really a big gap beside of the older steps and uh, to my uh, to make my uh, uh, pr uh, to make my points uh, uh, final, uh, it's also all about uh, the impacts. Sometimes a little drop is making more progress than the, the the information or the things that you find on the internet because it's your own personal drop. And if you make it for your personal really important, you get also the adrenaline enthusiasm to do more. So instead of only looking what others do, try to focus on what you should could do with others and try to cooperate in a so uh, nice cooperation that you can go in a partnership by scaling up with all the with community stakeholders and experienced people that uh, are respecting you. And uh, Alex, I'm so sorry. Yes. Less than three minutes. We, we literally have three less than three minutes to do the final thoughts. So I, I would suggest yes. that anyone who would like to follow up with the um, Brussels in the EU uh, to contact Alex so, uh, via the app. Uh, I would uh, give you thirty seconds each uh, because that's what we've got. I uh, hope that uh, we can extend it a little bit. Um, my on final thoughts is that uh, it's not only the private sector, the public sector should also be you know, fostering a millennials and generation Z. Of course, they are trying their best and try to uh, have a dialogue with them to understand how they can uh, improve those efforts. Um, above all, I'd love to see millennials becoming mentors to Generation Z. That's a conversation that I had with a few of you uh, so that they can learn how to become mentors and uh, they have a, a crosser link to the actual generation and below them, uh, and um, uh, generations that uh, up and coming ones are the most educated, you know, the, the best prepared, is the easiest possible today to create a new business. So let's make sure that they have a chance uh, to pay all the bills that we are racking up now with the pandemic. So uh, that said, um, Jakob, uh, 30 seconds. Absolutely. Uh, so I hear between the lines as well that we're talking a few of us are talking about mentorship and peer-to-peer -peer relations, and I, I totally agree with that. And I also feel that let our actions be a statement in itself. Uh, the actions we within our organizations do that will lead towards impact because you want to see that and uh, bring them along and uh, let's collaborate on it uh, between uh, governments, public and private and so on forth. Uh, so thank you. Over to Marcelo. Fantastic. No, I'm on deep. Your turn. Uh, yeah, uh, I would say that like, uh, let's look at all the positives that pandemic has brought. Uh, the collaboration can be more international, co more virtual right now. And let's not seek one global answer. It could, uh, it could depend on different cultures and geographies. And uh, let's keep these conversations stirring up and going.
that, that's me. fantastic. Vijay. Yeah, your turn, Vijay. Thanks again for joining. Uh, I think you're on mute. Yes, sorry. Yes, uh, in a nutshell, I'd like to be able to uh, answer the point on cross uh, mentoring, as I talked about, or cross generational mentoring. And I think that's important to address that a little bit more. It's not just about technical mentoring that I'm talking about, uh, as um, Kevin was talking. The issue is that you might know as much as you do on the technical scale of social media, this, that, and the other, but you wouldn't be able to balance your own checkbook. So sometimes it's just good to be able to get that. Are there things I learned from my granddad, uh, you know, that he couldn't have taught me in school, but extremely important in terms of uh, life. So there are many questions in life that we can learn from another generation. So I'd like to leave that. Uh, one quick point. There's a question raised by a Mohana in the audience who says that, does Gen Z also think work is survival in India? You could be two streets away and be in a totally different mindset in India. And I think that's the answer for that. Thank you. Oh, fabulous, Ajay. Thank you so much for your support uh, with the session and uh, the whole event. I'll try to get Kevin back. Let's see if that works, uh, getting him as one of the speakers. Hi. Kevin, uh, you guys got me? I know interrupted. Awake. You, you had time to go and get a coffee. So you're 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah, well, um, you know, I am inspired by everyone and what you're sharing. I think, uh, you know, again, I've been inspired mostly on the stories around uh, mentorship and cross connection. And I think that, um, you know, for me, it's, it's about how do we make that those relationships and that partnership more public? How do we share the stories with more people? that you know collaboration is possible and is accessible and actually amounts to something instead of it just being like you know where you swipe left and swipe right you know how do you do it where you find quality relationships that are going to change your life and change the path of the people in your community i think you know when you share more of those stories it inspires more people to think wow they should be looking out and they should be finding new connections and better quality connections than just the ones that they browse on their social media Well, that's great. So now we move to Alexander for your, your final 30 seconds to, to wrap your thoughts. Sorry for the interruption earlier. on. Yes. Uh, well, besides of my presentation, I would like to, uh, to inform everyone to just uh, try as, as much as you can and believe that it's possible because no matter if today is not happened or tomorrow, it can be happening once in your lifetime. So try to convince yourself to take that step and uh, try to uh, share it with others. So maybe even if you cannot uh, achieve it by your own uh, ideas or knowledge or your investment time, maybe other person can uh, realize your uh, idea or a thing that you can be really happy about it. So it's really uh, the step to make uh, more open and also to try more respect and trust people. And if you are not trusting, try to develop a contract instead of uh, a lot of other meetings because we like to make further steps. And by that point, if you have some uh, mistaken, just just uh, uh, try to try uh, at the beginning always and not making interruption in, in the meantime or uh, uh, hearing, yeah, but no, but, or yeah, maybe, or I don't know. These are uh, things that seriously need some more extra time. And these people can uh, work on themselves. You can help them. But of course, if they tell you and be open-minded. So uh, get yourself uh, in a good uh, basic uh, step and get a growth mindset eventually together. Oh, fantastic. So this is a wrap. Uh, we uh slightly late, so I hope we didn't take much time from the plenary session going on right now. Um, I would just like to say that oh, millennials are half of the workforce. So Gen Z are politically very active. They uh, they drink less. They're more focused on their careers. Um, it's looking pretty good for the next generation who are the alphas. And let's start talking alpha, right? And these are the 10-year-olds that we have now, 5 to 10 years old. Um, that uh, are going to inherit the earth. 
And um, let's try to make sure that the job is not harder than uh, it should be. Thank you again so much for this little tour from Europe, uh, India to Asia, and then back by Russia to Europe with uh, some holidays in Toronto. Uh, amazing uh, group of people. Uh, loved being here with you. And I hope to have a chance to meet in person very soon. So take care and all the best. All right, guys. Um, I believe that we may have to wrap this up. Yeah, you you can. <laughs> that these are the instructions that we didn't receive. How to leave the session? Uh, we can leave with a little red button at um, at the bottom left. Uh, I am yes. assuming that you all want to go back to other sessions. So my assumption is we can just close this window and uh, try to go back to run the world and the app or their website and we'll be able to, uh, to rejoin nice. as a participant. Nice meeting Bye, you guys. guys. Thanks guys. Bye-bye. Same to care.